Hello and welcome to this Analyst Angle 2024 Paris Olympics edition. I'm Bob LaLiberté, Principal Analyst with the Cube Research, and today I'm joined by Rob Streche, our Managing Partner and Principal Analyst also from the Cube Research. And we're here to discuss some of the announcements regarding technology that's being used at the Olympics this year. So welcome, Rob. Hey, great to be on. Um, having a lot of fun, uh, you know, by coastal uh, edition right. as well, you know, from Palo Alto and Boston. So lots of fun here. Awesome. Yeah, we've got it covered from Massachusetts to California. All right. <laughs> yeah. So I thought we'd spend a few minutes, given that the Olympics are starting this weekend, and there's been a number of announcements we've seen about technology that's going to be used. I know there's, there's certain rules and regulations, especially because they want it to come from an outlet in France and so forth. But seeing as I'm French, I feel like we're okay to talk about it. Um, so, you know, clearly there's been a lot of news that's come out and I wanted to just hit some of the, the key points. Are you okay with, with doing some of that, Rob? Yeah, I, I think that'd be great. I think there's a lot to talk about here. And I think that when you start to you know, peel it back, uh, it's pretty interesting what they're doing with this. Also, given, you know, the climate of what's been going on the last few weeks here, uh, I think it's definitely something to dig into. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'll start with one of the ones that I've been hearing about for a long time. This was well before a lot of the hype around the Olympics came out. And that was with data center provider Equinix, right? And they were have some really cool technology where they're talking about they're able to recover the heat that's emanating from their data centers. And they're going to use that to keep the Olympic pool warm. So that's pretty amazing when you think about it, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I think again, it's it's ingenious way uh, to actually think about how they're going to utilize the excess heat and from a sustainability perspective. You still have to dissipate that heat uh, for the data centers, and I think Equinix is really uh, one of the companies that's been at the forefront of sustainability from a data center perspective for quite a while. Yeah, absolutely. And, and they found other innovative ways. It's not just that they're heating the pool there. They've also built a greenhouse on the roof of the data center to provide fresh vegetables. And, and really they're doing that and giving that back to the community for those, uh, those individuals who are in need, they're able to, to provide that. And so a, a lot of this key technology has been their ability to convert the air to liquid, right? And have that, those exchangers so that they can transfer the heat more evenly. Um, I think this is also going to have some ramifications when more of the Gen AI, which is all a lot of people are talking about liquid cooling playing a central role there, that might make it even more efficient heat transfer. And one of the other things I saw about in this article was interesting is that not only was it just the heating the pool, providing the vegetables, but they're also even going to use it talking with local utilities providers to be able to heat homes in proximity of the data center as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I, th I think this this is really where a lot of these data center companies are aiming at. Uh, we know of others that are being built that are heating towns and things of that nature, or being built in mines uh, to be able to offput that, especially over in Europe, where there's uh, a lot of teeth to a lot of the regulations around sustainability. Uh, so I, I think, again, it's more than just talk about sustainability, it's about how do we actually do this. And like you said, the, the liquid cooling direct to the GPUs is a big thing. We're hearing about it from every vendor that we talk to. Uh, it's, it's key to being able to make the power go further so you're not you know, using a lot of power for the cooling as well. Uh, and I think that's a big thing when you start to talk about something like the Olympics where you're going to have an influx influx of people into Paris uh, trying to get around and you know powering all of these other devices that are going on and all of these events I, I think that to me is one of these things that you know again France is very well powered by a lot of nuclear power so that's even more sustainable uh, when you look at it than say uh, you know if it was in the US right at the moment yeah I think you know ultimately I look at this and it's just a great example of how organizations can combine increased business and greater levels of sustainability and give back to the communities in which they're serving. So great opportunity there. One of the other ones that I want to talk about caught my eye was I was reading about Orange um, and how they're going to be providing a private 5G connection for all of the boats that are in the Olympic opening parade. 
So I thought this was pretty cool. It, they went back and forth talking about, hey, instead of doing network slicing off of their public 5G, they're actually going to implement a Cisco private 5G to be able to connect to all the devices so they can stream live from the boats in the parade to give that perspective of what the athletes are seeing along that course. Yeah, I, I think that to me, and again, when you brought this up and we were talking about it beforehand, it, to me, it, it seemed like a natural fit for how this technology is evolving, uh, especially with, you know, do you go uh, people talking about Wi-Fi versus fi private 5G versus public? I, I think to me, this is where uh, a real coming out party could be for, you know, private 5G is these Olympics and all of the different types of venues they're going to have to be able to cover, not just, uh, you know, moving boats, which I think is a very unique uh, uh, application for it. But, it, you know, you start to think about this and what the application could be for other transportation uh, heavy industries. I think yeah. this is key. Yeah, and it's and clearly this is going to be a unique application because it's not just about communication of voice. This is about data and not just data, but video and potentially HD video. So tremendous amount of bandwidth that's going to be required to do it. So I'm looking forward to seeing how the private 5G stands up and how it's able to deliver on that performance and deliver that experience for that opening ceremony. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I, I know that, you know, when you start to unpack all of the people that are going to be there, you know, I mean, again, one of the other ones is one of our favorites is Intel, right? Yeah. I, I mean, coming in uh, from a chip perspective. And I, I think that to me, they have so many different chips, you know, every, you know, the GPUs are taking the oxygen out of the out of the room, but funny enough, stuff still needs to run on CPUs and other types of uh, accelerators and things of that nature. And they're yeah. one of the sponsors as well. What have you been hearing about them? Yeah, uh, at the no, absolutely, yeah. I think, like I said, Intel inside, right? So there's so many areas where that technology is being used. Some of the things that they were talking about is being able to power the 5G network. So Orange is their, their public 5G network as well, right? That's going to be in heavy demand. You think about all the streaming that's going on from the athletes that are on the boats. Now think about all the people who are on the shore viewing it, and they're most likely going to be streaming that and sending it to their friends and so forth. So that public 5G network is really going to see a huge pull, and they need to have make sure they've got the, the proper technology you know, powering that up. I think there's also going to be opportunities they mentioned around virtual reality, drones, as well, right? That's going to be a big part of the Olympics. You know, you think about the, the camera coverage and what's going on, so we're going to see things there. And I think they're also going to be using it for, I think they've mentioned that Intel is their, the official AI platform partner of the Paris Olympics as well. So certainly, like I said, they're looking to make sure that they've got the technology inside that's going to power all these activities. Yeah, I, I think that's the thing. When you start to talk about edge, we're not talking heavy GPUs at the edge. Uh, you're using a lot of CPUs uh, that can actually do uh, that type of Gen AI workloads and inference once things are trained uh, out at the edge. And I, I think that's with these AI assistants and things that will be deployed uh, around there, because I know they're, they have some big plans around virtual reality, like you were talking about, as well as to enhance uh, I guess you could say the customer experience. Uh, the other thing with Orange is they're heavily heavily partnered up with AT&T. So if you think about all of the people coming in, like you said, the influx onto their network for people who are just using that international traveling uh, will be huge as well. Absolutely, yeah, and it's another, Cisco also scored another win at the Olympics as NBC Universal, who's covering the Olympics, is using their Cisco IP media fabric to stream all of the Olympic events. So again, a great use of technology that's been specifically designed for the, the, the video place, right? And for the media to be able to leverage that. And this is something that I've had the opportunity to personally see in use at Gillette Stadium. They were one of the first organizations, instead of having all the big trucks outside, they actually built out their own IP media fabric internal and have their their own basically um, you know control center within the stadium to control the video and the way that plays out it's really cool instead of having to go out to the truck and through the the media partner 
they're able to stream the media to inside the stadium for that differentiated fan experience. So you can get replays and things like that a lot faster because the folks at Gillette Stadium are controlling it and it's a separate feed from what's going out to their media partner. So looking forward to seeing how all that plays out as well and how the, that coverage of the Olympics continues over the, the next couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah, and I know Google and they're doing AI with NBC as well. And I, I think what will be very interesting, uh, especially their you know Team USA's AI platform, I guess you could say, and it's like everybody's got to grab the AI platform, yeah. I guess badge. Uh, so you know when you start to look at uh, how conversational AI will change things, uh, hopefully it's better than some of the uh, you know things we've been seeing on Twitter where they're sleeping on cardboard boxes. Beds are built on out of cardboard uh, in the Olympic Village for some of the athletes. But, you know, you start to think about, hey, how can AI actually help me get to where I need to go to help that travel experience? This is something that has been talked about in sports for quite a while is that fan experience. That I need to um, give me an itinerary. What trains should I take? to get me to these events, especially in Paris, where the, the gridlock is gonna be off the charts from a traffic perspective, but the rail system and the subway system is pretty good. So, yeah. you know, how do we, you know, what one do I have to go and get from here to there, the RER from, you know, from uh, Charles de Gaulle to here to there, what, what am I gonna need to do? And I think AI will really, uh, be a platform for that to help out at the Olympics. Yeah, and I think we're, we're also looking forward to seeing how the, all the commentators for NBC will be able to leverage that Google AI to give you those fun farm facts. So I'm looking forward to seeing if they're going to be talking about, hey, this this bit of you know stat or this stat was presented by Google AI and whether they take it that far and, and how those commentators actually use the AI to deliver a differentiated experience. Um, yeah. You know, and also Great. talking about AI, another big piece that's been in the news a lot has been the surveillance that's going to be going on. Now they've stated due to the, the privacy laws, there will not be facial recognition going on. But I know that what they've said is they're going to be deploying a lot of surveillance cameras. They're gonna be leveraging AI. Again, I've seen this at work as well in both industry and, and the stadiums and how it works. And, and so just to give an example, when you think about that, how it would be worked without using facial recognition, it could be as simple as, hey, look, these trash cans are overflowing. Send someone to get it. It could be as much as you were talking about, how do we get around? Let's look at what gates are less crowded than others and be able to provide that information. So there's a lot of different uses that this AI surveillance, it also, and most importantly, I think why they wanna have it is for the safety and security of the athletes. So, you know, hey, this person's climbing a fence, make sure you send some, some police there to address that issue and things like that. So. And, and Orange Business, again, is driving that with a group of partners that they put together. So I, th I think, again, really, it's gonna be really interesting to see how some of this technology plays out at the Olympic venues and over the course of the Olympics and, and also as well, the, the Paralympics as well. Yeah, and I, I think you're exactly right. I mean, the good thing is they know where people are supposed to be. They can train the models on that, and they have been uh, you know, over the course of getting things stood up. Uh, they're able to then, you know, fine tune that as they go through to look for those abnormalities, I guess you could say, from a uh, perspective of, you know, where are people in the right places at the right times? What are all the different things that, you know, look anomalous? Uh, how people carry themselves. You don't have to do facial recognition to actually understand a bad actor. Uh, and in fact, you know, a lot of times it's it's not you, their faces are covered uh, or they're, they have some sort of mask, especially, you know, with COVID and stuff like that. Since then, there's still a lot of masks worn in uh, these busy places. So I, I think yeah. they got their work cut out for them, that's for sure. But I, I think, you know, with Orange has a, a significant uh, technology bench. Uh, I've worked with them in the past. Uh, they have, you know, brand names like LVMH, uh, you know, which is the Louis Vuitton yeah. brand, and all of the others that are, you know, run on that. And they're associated with all of the major clouds and have, uh, you know, fast interconnect. So, you know, with Google being partnered with, uh, you know, Team USA on and NBC on yeah. that and given that type of information. I think there's going to be a lot of bandwidth there uh, you know, with Equinox and with others and getting that out. So I, I think, again, uh, the AI surveillance part will definitely 
be interesting to see how it gets applied and uh, you know what comes out of it and what learnings come out of it, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely, and, and obviously being the networking guy, um, obviously all of that surveillance is going to need that, that uh, quite robust back-end network in order to support all of those, uh, the intelligence that they're using in that surveillance. So very interested, as I said, really interested in seeing how it all plays out. Hopefully it doesn't have to be used for anything nefarious and it's just as simple as helping people get to the stadiums and the, uh, and the venues more efficiently and being able to ensure the best possible experiences while they're in there. So, you know, clearly there's, there's other instances of technology being used, but these were the ones that, that caught our eye. And as I mentioned, you know, especially all the networking and things that are reliant on the network for us and, and what's going on at the Olympics. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. So I want to thank you for watching this Analyst Angle 2024 Paris Olympics edition. And Rob, I want to thank you for joining me as well. Yeah, it's always fun to jump on the cube with you and, uh, you know, in one of these analyst angles and break this all down.